you know, we, we saw it with the, with the Joel Kahn discussion, and you see it almost every time someone who's actually informed has a conversation with one of these influencers. Like, they're not being 100% accurate, objective, or even honest in a lot of cases. Hey, this is Ryan of Happy Healthy Vegan. So I was Joe Rogan there calling out people such as myself, I assume, for not being accurate, objective, and honest. So we'll see after we analyze what Chris Kresser said about veganism and the game changers, who's being accurate, objective, and honest. First of all, who is Chris Kresser? Why is Joe calling upon him for objective, honest, accurate information about health and nutrition? Is Chris a medical doctor, a nutritionist, a dietitian? About biochemist? No. He has a degree in acupuncture and in something called integrative medicine. Not from a medical school, from this school in Berkeley. Not the university, but this small school in the city of Berkeley. And Chris also loves to say how, as you'll see, vegans are deficient in all these vitamins and nutrients and so on, but he has a whole bunch of them for sale on his website for his very, I guess, deficient meat-eating followers. So based on no accurate science or objective fact or truth, Joe and Chris firmly believe that people who don't eat meat are on this slow decline. So in the absence of the correct amount of amino acids, the correct amount of specific nutrients, you start to see a slow decline. So talk about being objective and truthful. Please cite some kind of study backing up your position because all I see here is you just making stuff up. The problem here is something that I call the vegan honeymoon. You take someone who's been on a standard American diet, they're eating KFC, McDonald's, etc., and they switch from that to a plant-based diet. Well, of course they're going to feel better. But then what happens over a longer period of time? You know, some not getting enough protein, micronutrient deficiencies, you know, vitamin A, zinc, calcium, iron, things like that take a while to develop. So you're not going to see that decline in performance happen right away. It might take three months, it might take six months, it might take nine months. So I should definitely be seeing this decline in performance that Chris says should be happening to me because I'm way past the vegan honeymoon phase now. Says these deficiencies start kicking in after one, two, three years and then your performance declines. Well, I'm nine years vegan and I'm able to do things athletically now that I was never able to do before when I was younger or not vegan. At 52 years old now, I can slam dunk a basketball. I'm playing some of the best basketball of my life. And I'm not like some world-class athlete. I'm just some YouTuber, music producer, and guy running for city council. So you have to not just look at what happens a month after someone goes vegan. You have to look at what happens six months, a year after, or two years after. Well, again, let's try nearly nine years after. And here's my blood test from earlier this summer. I made a whole video about this going in way more detail, but I'll just flash them all here. You can pause it or click the link to see the entire video. I'm not falling apart, I'm not deficient in anything, including vitamin D, vitamin B12, not pre-diabetic. So Chris is just making stuff up and not offering any scientific support to what he's saying here. Even if a plant-based diet might work for one person, does it, will it scale? You know, if you, if you take that to the full level of like everyone eating a plant-based diet, which is the argument that is being made, does it really work from a nutritional perspective? All right, fair enough. Just because the vegan diet's working out so well for me, one person, doesn't mean it has to work well for anyone else. Well, that's an opinion. But if you look at fact, the official position of the American Dietetics Association, who happens to be the largest group of health professionals in our country, they clearly say that appropriately planned vegan diets are nutritionally adequate for people in all stages of life. They further go on to say that vegan diets are nutritionally adequate when it comes to certain nutrients that Chris Kresser is completely scared of for vegans, such as protein, iron, zinc, vitamins, B12, and D, and so on. One of the things they talked about was protein content, and I immediately knew that this was not correct or that they were being deceptive. They were talking about three ounces of steak versus, uh, what do they compare, a peanut butter sandwich and maybe some lentils? Is that what it was? Oh boy. For the pro the peanut butter sandwich thing, it was like there's a, there's the same amount of protein in a peanut butter sandwich as there is in three ounces of beef. So I, I looked up the data, of course. So three ounces of 90% lean ground beef has 24 grams of protein. You get two slices of wheat bread. We'll give them the benefit of the doubt that it's whole wheat and not white bread. That's five okay. grams. 
So Chris is severely underrepresenting how much protein's in two slices of wheat bread. So either he has bad data sources, he's lying, or has trouble with really basic math. Let's go to chronometer. Two slices of wheat bread is nine grams of protein. And the Ezekiel bread that I use is eight grams of protein for two slices. So I'm not sure where Chris is getting five grams of protein from. One tablespoon of peanut butter is four grams. So you'd have to have five tablespoons of peanut butter in that sandwich to equal three ounces of beef. That's All right, so let's stop Chris here for a moment because he's taken what James Wilkes said in the movie completely out of context. James was trying to show people who are new to plant-based diets that it's actually quite easy and simple to find foods that you're probably really familiar with that have similar amounts of protein to eating eggs or steak. Let's see what James said exactly. For example, one cup of cooked lentils or a peanut butter sandwich has about as much protein as three ounces of beef or three large eggs. Did we all hear clearly what James said there? Because what he said there is true, that a cup of lentils or a peanut butter sandwich has about, which means similarly, in the same ballpark, the amount of protein that you'll find in three ounces of beef or three large eggs. And let me show you. So I created a recipe on chronometer here for a peanut butter sandwich, and I used two slices of whole wheat bread, like we talked about earlier, with its nine grams of protein. And once you add in two tablespoons of peanut butter, you have over 16 grams of protein. And for a cup of cooked lentils, that's almost 18 grams of protein. So let's compare that with three cooked eggs, and it's a pretty similar number, 16.6 grams of protein. And for three ounces of beef steak, that's a little over 22 grams of protein. So yes, a peanut butter sandwich or a cup of lentils gives you about the same amount of protein as three eggs or a three ounce steak does. And James showed this example merely to make a point about how easy it is for him to get his protein requirements, even as an athlete. So I crunched the numbers from the study and realized that based on the amount of calories I was eating, I'd still be getting more than enough protein to build and maintain muscle. Then, as you pointed out, it's all about protein quality. And yeah. this, as you said, this is an established science, firmly established science. They look at this, especially like in third world countries where protein deficiency is common. No, this notion of there being a protein deficiency in people in third world countries was popular in the 60s and 70s and has long been debunked. And unfortunately, some people like Chris didn't get the memo. So the, the most recent scale that's used is called the DS, digestible, indispensable amino acid score. So the DS for beef, rare beef is 1.39. It's among the highest scores on the whole scale. The DS for egg is 1.13. For peanut butter, it's 0.45. And for wheat, it's 0.2. Those are among the lowest proteins that, are, that have been measured on the scale. Wow, so that sounds pretty horrible, right? Like a score of 1.39 for rare beef versus 0 0.045 for peanut butter. So it sounds like vegans are pretty screwed if you take Chris at his word here. And I don't profess to be an expert at this DS scale of measuring protein absorption that Chris is referring to here, but there are a few key points that I think we need to take a look at. Well, first of all, all these DIA scores are based strangely upon the nutritional requirements for toddlers ages 1 to 3, while the most demanding years for your essential amino acid requirements are those of infant years. And also combine this with the fact that as children get older and transition to adulthood, the less proportions of essential amino acids they will need. So here's the kicker, guys. This also means that many of the vegan protein sources that are limited in one or more essential amino acids are actually less deficient in essential amino acids for adults, perhaps not deficient at all. Meaning these absurdly low DIA scores for vegan sources of foods are not to be taken to be deficient numbers. You know, I don't know whether it's because they they really don't understand the science behind it or because they do and they're just, you know, it's being kind of exaggerated to suit the their claim. Well, isn't that exactly what you're doing here, Chris? Exaggerating the differences between these high DS score numbers for meat and these conveniently low DS score numbers for wheat and peanut butter and trying to make people believe they're not going to get enough absorbable amino acids as adults if they're not eating meat. Hmm. There's a great Leon Festinger quote. I don't know if you've heard it. A man with conviction is a hard man to change. Tell him you disagree and he turns away. Show him the facts and figures and he questions your source appeal to logic and he fails to see your point. 
I can't say I've heard that quote before, but I can fully relate here. This is where it just gets very frustrating for me. Yeah. Because, like, if you want to make an argument that you should probably follow a more complicated diet, more complicated meaning that it's more difficult for you to acquire in some cities, you have to be a little bit more careful about getting supplementation with vitamin B12 and, mm -hmm. uh, and essential amino acids. you got to be a little bit more careful. So this is really funny here. So Joe's saying if you're vegan, you have to take on these extra burdens in life, take all these supplements. It's a big pain in the butt. It's too hard for most people. Yet Joe, who is clearly not vegan, takes a bunch of supplements. I take vitamin supplements every day. I take uh, multivitamins, I take probiotics, I take uh, vitamin B12 and D and a lot of different things. Yeah. yeah, testosterone replacement therapy, hormone replacement therapy. I started doing all that when I was 40. You know, the, the idea that plant-based agriculture doesn't kill animals is just false. I mean, there have been studies that show that particularly monocropping type of plant agriculture kills far more animals than are killed in, you know, from eating cows, for example. Oh, really, Chris? So it's not like non-vegans and animals, they don't eat the food that's produced from these monocrops? And so that presents an, an ethical dilemma, really. If you are saying, I'm a vegan because I don't want my food choices to involve killing animals, so instead of letting Chris, an anti-vegan, define veganism and vegan morals for us vegans, let me show Chris the definition of vegan from the Vegan Society, a pretty good definition, which it says it's a way of life which seeks to exclude as much as practically possible all forms of exploitation and cruelty to animals. And notice how nowhere in that definition does it say that there can be absolutely no harm whatsoever, like a bug or a rodent might get harmed in farming, and if so, then all of veganism is null and void. Just go out and kill animals needlessly. I mean, Chris is just bringing up the appeal to futility fallacy, which it says like, hey, there's no way we can stop all harm, so why even bother? Just let it all be, man. Well, let's get back to what he said earlier, though, about how all these animals get killed, more animals get killed even, by harvesting and then just raising animals for slaughter, which is not true. But let's look at what this actual studies have, have shown on this. They have put radio trackers on mice in fields and seen what happens when the combine harvesters are harvesting. And the animals aren't stupid. Have you ever tried to catch a mouse or a rabbit? They run from you. So imagine what a large multi-ton noisy vehicle would do. Yeah, the mice are pretty much left intact. They are not harmed by the combine harvester. And to further show how wrong Chris and and Joe are, there have been calculations to estimate the number of animals killed to produce 1 million calories of food in eight food categories. And no surprise, chicken, eggs, beef, and pork are at the top, and at the bottom are vegetables, fruits, and grains. Again, please provide some objective facts, some evidence, if you're going to throw out these claims, guys. Let me Just give you their argument for that. They say that most of these monocrops are to feed animals. Yes, Joe, we have pointed this out to you many times when responding to you in our videos, so maybe you've been watching. That you're saying that eating a vegan diet and all these monocrops, that these monocrops are killing all these small animals. They're saying no, these monocrops, most of them actually exist to feed livestock. That's, that's not true. Um, Chris, yes, it's completely objectively true. It's beyond dispute. As I will show you in a second, you're going to feel embarrassed that you disagreed with this point, but let's see Chris try to reason his way out of this by making stuff up. I mean, if, if you follow this through, I mean, especially when you start talking about like fake meat and some, you know, yes. they're, they're all, what are, what are those based on? So Oils. Soil. Yeah. Yeah. They're industrial crops. They're not you know, grown on the family farm. These right. are industrial GMO monocrops. Massive, massive On a fields. massive scale. Okay, so much wrong there, and I wish I could just dedicate a whole video to this one response of Chris's here, but I'll try to be brief. I mean, it assumes that vegans are eating all this soy, we're responsible for all these horrible, massive monocrops, and vegan burgers are made out of soy, which some are. That was very true a long time ago, but it's 2019, almost 2020 here. Let's look at the market leader, the Beyond Burger from Beyond Me, and you'll, you'll see here, it's soy-free and it's non-GMO. So that was Chris's lame make-believe fantasy excuse there for what's happening with soy. Let's look at the real data here. According to this University of Michigan report, 98% of all soy grown in America is used for animal feed, and only 1% goes for human food. 
So if Chris really wants to walk his talk here about being the great animal rights activist protecting animals from combine harvesters, he would advocate that people stop eating this factory farmed meat, which is where 98% of the soy and a similar percentage of corn is going to. So Chris does sort of walk his talk saying he advocates that people eat grass-fed beef in order to help save the planet. Really a uh, systemic change that needs to happen in a big way. What percent, and this would have, you'd have have to have all of the meat be grass-fed meat because they would be eating what they naturally eat. Now, what is the percentage of grass-fed meat in this country currently? Uh, I don't know for sure. I think the number I read was something like two or three percent, so very low. Very small. Yeah. Well, this is just completely untenable because there's simply not enough land to get people to switch from factory-raised meat to grass-fed beef. There's just simply not enough land. There's 1.9 billion acres of land in the lower 48 states, and already half of that is is being utilized for grazing. So how in the world are you gonna go from like say 3% of the beef market share, which grass-fed beef is now, to get even to like 10%. There's simply not enough land in the United States. What is your plan? Are you planning to take over Mars and terraform it for cattle? All right, guys, I'm noticing this video is getting quite long. I didn't want to make a 30 minute response video, but I had a bunch of other clips prepared of Chris's here that I wanted to respond to. So instead of throwing them all away, I will save them for some more future response videos because this is going to take several videos to go through and just answer his anti-vegan propaganda here. And as I said at the beginning of the video, let me know in the questions and comments if I fulfilled my duty to you guys to present information the most accurate, objective and honest way possible. I shared science with you whenever I could, studies to back up the claims I was making, and showed how in most cases that Joe and Chris were just making stuff up. Anyway, leave your questions and comments down below. Let me know if you think I fulfilled that duty. Let me know what you thought when you saw this podcast of Chris's and Joe's originally, and hit like and share it with Joe Rogan and Chris Kresser fans. Remember guys to vote vegan. Yes, I'm running for city council in Long Beach, District 2. If you live in Long Beach, you can vote for me next year in March. And if you live anywhere in the United States, you can contribute to my campaign. Please, everyone, go check out my website, ryanlum.net.